to LDM Radio Sports Talk, the show that talks about sports and other topics relatable to sports fans. Uh, my name is Alfonso Caldero, and joining me once again is Scott Blander uh, in, from a remote location in Pennsylvania. Yeah! <laughs> How are you, buddy? Feeling good, feeling good. So, uh, it was a pretty exciting week uh, since, our last, uh, since our show last week. Uh, we're going to start the show off with uh, talking about the Steph Curry night that happened at MSG the other night. Did you end up uh, catching the action? No, I did not. I saw a lot of people uh, raving and ranting uh, about it. <laughs> people, um, he, he set a record, correct? Yes. Uh, he is the sole owner of the the most three-pointers made in the history of the NBA. What? No. Oh. Very impressive. Yeah. So, what it, it went? Um, it was a. It's. It. Uh, it was a uh, Ray Allen. Yeah. 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 Larry Bird wasn't even uh one of the higher ones. Um. So, it, in looking at the actual numbers here, that it, it's 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 mind boggling, really, how this how this all went down. So, Steph Curry, he's he made the most three pointers. Uh, so Ray Allen uh, previously had the record 2,973 three-pointers made in exactly 1,300 games. And it took Steph Curry 789 games to break this record. So Wow, that is amazing. 300 yeah. less games. That is unbelievable. And about 1,600 less attempts. And in uh, about... I'd say 60% of the minutes that uh, Ray Allen ended up playing. <laughs> so it's absolutely fan like pretty much the, the the way I equate it is Steph Curry's pretty much the like the Shaquille O'Neal of three pointers. You know how like when Shaquille O'Neal came and he was you know dominating the league and then they had to like make rules to work against what was working for him, but what made it so easily for him. Uh, I just think there's you know I mean there's really nothing you could do about. Um, like the three pointers, it's just it's a remarkable feat. And now, you know, in this day and age in the NBA, people are just hitting three pointers from all over the place. And you even have, you know, like what they call the the stretch four, where a lot of power forwards can even drop a three pointer, which is not normal compared to the way basketball was in you know the seventies, eighties, and nineties. Mm. So, absolutely. So it you know it's 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 a fantastic feat for him. Um, it, it was great that he ended up doing it in the garden. A, a lot of people suspect that he was saving it for the garden, but I really don't. My opinion is that he wasn't really saving it for the garden. He was just trying to get it done as soon as he could. Um, the night before, he played in Indiana against the Pacers, and he went five for fifteen. So, you know, he only needed two, three. He only needed one three pointer to tie, and then another one to break it. So it was only he came into the garden only needing two, which makes sense. But you know, if you you go five for fifteen the game before, you're not really you know trying to dog it, especially since it was a pretty close game and the Warriors had to pull it out at the end. It wasn't like it was a uh, you know the Warriors were up by like forty points and he could do whatever he wanted to do. You know, so. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I, I I find it kind of hard to believe that he intentionally tanked uh, ten shots there so he could do it at the garden. I don't see that happening. <laughs> yeah, what well, what a lot of people have to realize is that you know that it's a business too. So there there had to be you know situations where he had to win the games and you know like the most important thing in any sport is winning the game. So definitely had to win against Indiana. Uh, Indiana actually had a. a uh, it was it was fairly close contest uh, through three quarters, and then uh, the Warriors picked it up in the fourth quarter. But it wasn't you know it was any it wasn't a, a gimme game by any uh, stretch of the imagination. So definitely did not save it for MSG. It just so happened that it worked out that way. And then you know a lot of Knicks fans um, they they're uh, you know they they don't like the Steph Curry name only because 
we were supposedly supposed to pick him uh, with the pick. Bef- um, well, we had the eighth pick that year, and then he ended up getting picked sixth, uh, seventh by the the Golden State Warriors, which in all reality probably worked out better for him than anything else <laughs> with the dynasty that they were able <laughs> to build over there. Um, but, you know, if, if he would have came to New York, you know, obviously it would have been a, a much bigger thing. I don't know if he would have had as many titles as he does right now. You know, it, it totally changes all the history. But, you know, that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Uh, a lot of Knicks fans, you know, I was uh, talking to a bunch of them, and, you know, some of them say that they should have, you know, traded up for him. But, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, you can't really um, predict that anybody, you know, if obviously if, they, you know, the, the – the, um, Minnesota Timberwolves passed on him twice. They had two picks uh, in the top six that year. So, you know, if, you know, obviously if everybody knew he was going to be that great, then he would have went number one instead of going, dro- dropping all the way down to seven. So <laughs> that's just the way it goes, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, yeah, exactly. You, you, you never know with, with some of these draft picks. Uh, I mean, you know, different sport, of course, but Tom Brady, seventh round, Mike Piazza, five. 62nd round, I want to say. Don't quote me exactly the round, but uh, it was something well, well, you know, down. You never know with, with some of these. And, of course, you, you know, you, you can, you can, you, you know, there's an, an uh, unlimited number of one through fives in every sport that have, you know, turned into absolutely nothing. So, you know, like you said, it's where the cookie crumbles. You never know. You can't predict these things. It is what it is. Yeah, I think the, that's actually the one of the biggest fascinations when it comes to drafts. You know, there's there's so much money put into scouting and, you know, like from, you know, player development standpoints, how many actual scouts and people are just dedicated to watching people and watching the drafts and such. And then you have, you know, like all the money that goes into the actual draft nights and, you know, the resources to bring to shuttle people in and out to, you know, interview them and meet them. You know, obviously in the in the COVID world that we're in right now, they a lot of it's remote, but you know, before that a lot of you know, people used to come in, they like some of them would have like open workouts to, you know, have a bunch of teams, you know, basically just a, a bunch of uh frequent flyer miles going back and forth about how every you know, how much money you spent and, you know, just to to bomb the picks, you know, like there's, there's no exact science to it. No matter how much money you throw at it, no matter how many people, you know, quote unquote geniuses and such like that, you know, the, the players, they have to like, whoever gets picked, it's like, you have to perform and there's no way of telling the future. Some, some players like, like we, we talked about Christian McCaffrey last week, you know, they just can't stay on the field, you know, and that just, it's, it, it's unfortunate, but that's not, you know, it's not a reflection on anything that would be, in a scouting report or, you know, past performances because he used to dominate, you know, in his uh, high school and college careers and such like that. And it's just, you know, you can't really predict the future, but teams throw tons and tons of money trying to. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, when a player – it's very unfortunate when a player doesn't uh, live up to their potential or have the career that they should because of injuries. We're seeing it with McCaffrey. Uh, Giants are seeing it with with, with Saquon. Uh, You know, a big name that comes to mind, Eric Lindros. I remember when he was coming into the league in the early 90s, there was all the Gretzky comparisons. And he was very good and very dominant, but unfortunately concussions got the better of him. uh, And he retired before uh, before he was able to do the damage that everybody thought that he would do in terms of statistics and championships and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate whether you like a player or don't like a player you don't like to see a you know a guy have sustaining injuries and not uh you know for for the sake of of the entertainment and, and being a sports fan you know you want to see uh you know guys excel and break records and whatnot and it's a shame when a guy who has the potential to doesn't uh you know because of unfortunate injuries that's not something we like to see in the sports world but that is the reality uh, absolutely 100 percent. so uh just uh we have some uh stats according to espn so the the last the three games that he uh, that Steph Curry had before uh, going into the Garden, uh, he went. He ended up. He was uh, playing Portland at home, and he went six for seventeen, thirty five percent. Then he went to Philadelphia, and he shot three for fourteen from three point range, twenty one percent. Then uh, the Indiana game that I spoke about earlier, where he was five for fifteen, so thirty three percent, and even actually in the 
the game at the uh, at the Garden, you know, he hit his first two three pointers, but then the rest of the game he ended up going uh, three for twelve. So you know, it wasn't exactly him saving it for the Garden. I think you know, if he would have hit a couple more against the the Seventy Sixers, which they actually lost that game, um, so I'm sure he wasn't you know trying to dog those threes. So there was you know, there was no plausible way that he was actually trying to save it for the Garden. It just ended up working out that way. Uh, question, where is this, uh, you, you know, th- th- this opinion of saving it for the garden? Where, where is that coming from? Is that coming from, from New York sports fans or is that coming from like the national, uh, media? I'm just curious because, you know, there is the, uh, the quote unquote East Coast bias or their New York sports fan bias and whatnot that, uh, you know, that, that people would think that he was saving it for Madison Square Garden. I mean, that's not his home arena. Um, so I'm just curious, where where was that uh, that opinion coming from? Was that a New York based uh, attitude, or is that uh, a, a nationwide thing? Yeah, I'd say it was a New York one because uh, it, it was a, like you know throughout the weeks and uh, different things like that. I meet a lot of different sports people and talk a lot of different sports, so definitely was an East Coast thing. It wasn't something that I saw um, on a the television or anything like that. But that was pretty much the the wide consensus. Maybe you know about like. Eight to ten different people you know, mentioned that we're all parading around about it, like how it was a, a a big thing, and you know, like they saved it for the mecca and such like that. Yeah, fair enough. You know, before I asked that, I was I, I should have looked up where he was from. I'm thinking like, all right, well, the answer is going to be New York, but it's not. Uh, you know, I looked it up. He's from Akron, Ohio. So in which case. Yeah, it's probably just New York sports fans being New York sports fans and thinking that, uh, you know, New York is the capital of all things sports. And, you know, I am a New York sports fan, of course. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes I think that that's a little over uh, overblown uh, as far as, you know, New York being the capital of everything. We <laughs> seem to be lacking on overall uh, titles these days. So, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to call BS on, uh, on, on that one and, and say it just, kind of luck of the draw that it happened there <laughs> in right. my opinion so well so we're just going to finish up with uh, a little bit of light nba talk so the new york knicks are not doing well right now they they had um they had three players go down with the um uh, uh with the covid protocols uh two of them being uh, rj barrett and ob toppin which are very very important uh players to how their um overall performance is and now uh, they are in a in a situation where they're not in the playoff picture. Even with the with, with the, dropping down to the ten teams, they are twelve and sixteen. The interesting fact here is when they ended up initially benching um, Kemba Walker and saying that he's not going to play, you know, because of rotation issues and team chemistry and things like that. After paying him a boatload of money, um. They were ten and nine at the time. Right now, they're they're two and seven since they ended up doing that. Yeah, uh, I know that Knicks fans had a uh, had a lot of high hopes coming into this year. Uh, that correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they did make the playoffs last year, and uh, I know that they've uh, slowly but surely been putting something together. Um, again, it's early. Uh, you know, it is early, and. You know, like like we've seen the um, in the NBA the last well, not really the last few years, but the the last few playoff spots uh, is usually around five hundred, uh, give or take. So yeah, I guess when you when you make the playoffs, you always want to you know, unless you're tearing it down and rebuilding, which they're not obviously. Um, you know, when you make the playoffs, the, the the idea is to expand on it and and take the next step, um, the next year which they may or may not be doing. Again, it's very early in the season, and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of teams all across the board in every sport are starting to get hit with the COVID uh, protocols and, 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 you know, guys being uh, – guys obviously taking some time off away from the team. Uh, the NHL is just shutting teams down completely for, you know, half week, week at a time. Uh, it's only a matter of time, I'd say, before you start seeing that uh, in other sports as well. Um, so we'll see what happens when they get everybody back and, uh, can practice together and start, you know, get their, get their chemistry back together, maybe to where it was last year. Uh, we'll see, you know, you don't know if last year was a fluke or if they're looking to take the next step, uh, the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll tell the tale. Yeah. I'd say, uh, unfortunately the, the way I view this season so far is that it, it's going to come down to 
uh, there's going to be, you know, a blockbuster deal, I think, where they just give up too many assets. It looks like that's the road that, that, that we're going down right now. And hopefully that doesn't happen because, you know, I like all the pieces and I don't like uh, trading a bunch of depth just for one player, you know, just to come in and try to, you know, basically save the season and things like that. You know, like, you know, to to have somebody come in just for money uh in the off season and then have the whole you know training camp and you know all that time to learn different plays playbooks things like that is one thing but to have a mid-season trade and to expect you know maybe one maybe two pieces you know that'd be like a, a superstar and like a lower level uh role player who's like really really good in a, a particular role um having those guys come in and then you know giving up a bunch of assets like rj barrett or emmanuel quickly or uh lb topping i don't think it's gonna be it's gonna be great uh toward the end because then you're gonna you know you're just basically removing the depth for somebody i think it worked for the lakers when they ended up um when they initially got lebron james and then they ended up uh trading for anthony davis they traded the house for him um but then they replenished with you know on the cheap veterans where they, all they want to do is win, so they just come on the team, you know, for pretty much pennies compared to what they're usually used to making. And um, I don't see that situation happening um, with the New York Knicks right now, but I do see a big trade in the future where they're going to, you know, trade a lot of people. that they, They're they going to trade some players that people didn't, don't want to see. Well, New York Knicks don't, fans don't want to see traded, but they're going to try to get a big name and they're going to try to hit a homer with it. Yeah, well, as Rangers fans in the Glen Sather era, we are no strangers to uh, <laughs> giving up the uh, the future for a chance to win now. And you know what? There's something to be said for that in any sport, but you have to be on the verge if you're going to do that. You know, you, you see that a lot in hockey, especially in hockey with, um, you know, the trading deadline and, 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 and the term rentals. You know, guys who are on the last year of their contract who are going to be UFAs uh, that a team's trying to get rid of because they know that they're going to break the bank. Um, but you have to be on the verge if you're going to roll the dice and give up your potential future to try and win now. So, you know, the Knicks, whatever they're doing, whether they are on the way uh, or not, even if they are on the way, they're not there yet. So that would, you know, I I would not agree with with giving up uh, draft picks and prospects for, uh, you know, for a shot to win now if you don't have the team that is one or two guys away from being a title contender. You know, let the season play out and then see what you can do in the draft and free agency. And maybe this time next year you're having that conversation. But I don't think they're ready to have that conversation now to give up their future for, uh, you know, for some high priced talent. Uh, if that's not going to put them over the edge. Yeah, I'd say draft picks I don't have a problem with because draft picks are always like kind of 50 50 on whether you actually get somebody really good or just get a dud. Um, which the Rangers, of uh, speaking of the Rangers, they've, you know, they made a, um, they made a tradition of trading their first round picks there for what was it like six, seven years? <laughs> um, but I don't, you know, I don't see I, like the the draft picks. I wouldn't, but like to hit a homer, like to get like a you know a Damian Lillard from Portland, you know, or a big name like that. That that's something that takes more than just draft picks. Like you have to go out and you know you'd have to give up like NBA ready players like a RJ Barrett or a Obi Toppin and things like that. And those those are the ones that I think build the the future toward and they're young enough to you know they'll be on the cheap for a little bit before they you know command the big money if they do end up ha- reaching that superstar status um but you know we'll, we'll see how it ends up going uh and then in the uh, uh the other local nba news we have um the brooklyn nets who are number one in the eastern conference at 20 and 8 so they're doing it up and doing it big right now <laughs> Yeah, and I think we saw that coming. Uh, I know that Nets had a very, very big off season a couple of years ago, and um, you know it looked like you know putting all their eggs in one basket. It looked like you know are they was it going to be a bust? And it just took another year to uh, you know to materialize. But clearly they are firing on all cylinders, and uh, now they could be a team <laughs> that uh, if they're if they are a piece away or whatnot at twenty and eight, uh, they may not be a piece away. They might be there, but they're, they're, that's a team that could uh, you know could sacrifice something for the future to try and put the finishing touches uh, on a title on a potential title run. Well, they, they still have, but uh, yeah. 
they still haven't had the services of Kyrie Irving because of uh, the the COVID. He w- he won't get the uh, vaccination and such like that. And especially with the uh, with the way the world's going right now, and there seems to be a resurgence of the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic hitting the sports world uh, as as well as the rest of the world. Um, you know, it's it's all that more or all that more huge. But you know, you have uh, James Harden who's back up to averaging 20 points a game and then Kevin Durant who's just playing at an all world level which is his normal consistent way of uh playing going about his business um at 29 points um a game so he definitely um they are on the right track um but they do have there's a, there's been a lot of talk of uh the possibility of a Kyrie Irving you know getting traded to another team you know that has like a state with different regulations where he wouldn't have to be mandated to be uh vaccinated so there is that potential trade chip uh down the road but you know the likely you know with, with the way the sports world's going on right now with a couple of games in the nhl getting canceled and such like that uh that might not be possible by the time that trade would be able to be swung to fruition yeah, and, and like I said before, it's uh, I think it's only a matter of time before you see the NBA follow suit with the uh, uh, you know shutting down you know in a temp- temporary, of course, but uh, giving these teams a break until they can get everybody uh, healed or testing negative, whatever the case may be. I think the NHL has been a good model for this since day one. Remember when sports were completely shut down when this whole thing started in um, spring of 2020 when the NHL came back. And they did the bubble with the, um, you know, the three or four playoff sites and, you know, nobody, nobody in, nobody out. And they had zero, you know, cases, zero uh, positive tests, zero cases, and were able to complete the season. Um, And, but, you know, you obviously that was a one shot deal and you, you couldn't do that. Uh, beyond that and uh, you know everybody has to live their lives and play in public now and and yeah we are seeing the resurgence but again the NHL was the first team really to uh you know with, with once the fans were back in the stands the NHL was really the first t- uh league to <clears throat> put shut teams down they did it with Ottawa then they did it with the Islanders uh I think Calgary I believe uh they they just did a couple games or maybe they're going to I know I've been seeing their names uh in the news yes, as far Calgary, as you know, a, a lot Calgary of had uh three games uh this week canceled oh, okay. uh, postponed so um yeah so I mean the NHL is, has um pretty much been the pioneer in procedures for these things and I think it's only a matter of time before the other leagues uh take suit I can't see the NFL doing that uh just because the NFL is the NFL and they think they're more powerful than COVID, but uh, I can see the NBA, and not to mention, you know, we're winding down here and, um, you know, they've, they've, you know, they basically got one game a week. Well, not basically they, they do, they have one game a week. Um, and now they're on a very tight schedule. So I don't think the NBA, the NFL will do it, but I could totally uh, see the, the NBA get involved here and, uh, and do the same. They, they absolutely should. There's really no reason not to. I have to agree there. So, all right, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll stick with the MB, uh with the NFL right now and the AFC wild card race uh just within the last week has become just absolutely ridiculous. We have right now um <laughs> so the division leaders right now the 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 New England Patriots are still at the the technically the top seed at 9 and 4, but the Tennessee Titans are also 9 and 4. The Kansas City Chiefs are also nine and four, and the Ravens are eight and five. Then the wild card race is just absolutely it, it's it's mind blowing how like the we were talking last week about how uh, how balanced it is, and in one week it's just gotten even more balanced. So we have the Chargers right now at seven and five, holding down the wild card. Well, the, the three wild card slots that are being held out right now are the Los Angeles Chargers at seven and five. The Cincinnati Bengals at seven and five, and the Buffalo Bills at seven and five. Then the teams that are on the cusp of being in the playoffs is the Indianapolis Colts at seven and six, the Cleveland Browns at seven and six, Pittsburgh still hanging six six and one, uh, Denver is six and six, La- uh, Las Vegas Raiders are six and seven, and the Miami Dolphins are six and seven. 
Yeah, I'm looking at that now as well. And, um, you know, like we talked about last week, um, while there is no real clear cut favorite, like, uh, you know, like, like we, it's funny because we, we did talk about the Patriots being right back up there. This is obviously not, you know, we're not viewing the Patriots with the same, uh, terror that we did in the Tom Brady <laughs> era Patriots, but, uh, you know, they are up there, but so there's no real clear cut favorite in either league. And when you have that, that means a lot of parity in the, um, you know, in the middle and, and, and the, the slightly above average. So yeah, it's very, very crowded there, uh, with what, four games to go, three, three games to go. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a, we're going to have a barn burner of a, of, of the last three weeks. It's going to be very interesting. A lot of these teams are, going to, are playing each other. Uh, the, the NFL certainly, uh, in terms of playoff positions, has as much drama in these last three weeks, you know, league wide than I've ever seen. I don't think. Yeah, I think it just it, it makes it more interesting. Like like I mentioned last week, you know, right right now all of these fan bases are into it still. They're all like, you know, they're not, you know, because usually it got to the point where. In, you know, if your team had like six losses, you were pretty much like, if if you had six losses at this point of the season, you're pretty much done. You know, like you would think you'd have to like just go on a, you know, you have to run the table basically to to make the playoffs. Nine and seven didn't seem like it was good enough, and it still might not be. But you know, right now that you know, there's you know a team like Miami that that was pretty much as low as you can get uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Right now are you know, only one game away from, from the playoffs. They, I mean, they need, they need a lot of help. They need to jump in. But, um, you know, a lot of these teams will need help uh, to get in. But, you know, it's, it's still good that they're, you know, like they're still in it. You know, like the, the fan bases could still be excited about it. Uh, being a New York Jets fan, I, would, I really wouldn't know what that's like because usually the season's over by December, which they're they're following that yearly tradition <laughs> right now. But you know, for 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 other teams of sports of sports fans that are pretty good, or at least you know in the middle of the pack, like the teams we just mentioned, it's, it's a good thing. You know, it's really good for the sport. Um, I think there used to be an emphasis on you know pushing the 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 superstar teams because. You know, like you want to have like those, you know, like those iconic legends to hang on to and such like that. But I, I'm all about parody. I think the the it's divide and conquer basically is what would drive more money to the bottom line than just having like two or three teams or even four teams going, you know, being almost invincible and then facing off at each other in the end. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100 um, percent. You know, college football has gotten uh a little redundant and boring in the past, uh, you know, six, seven years because, you know, it's pretty much been Alabama, Georgia, maybe throwing LS. I mean, Alabama is it is there every year, uh, Ohio state. And then it's just, you know, pick two other teams. Uh, and, you know, you had Clemson in there for about five, six straight years as well. So, you know, it was, it was three teams and then, you know, basically three playoff spots predetermined at the beginning of the season and then a wild card. So, you know, and it got redundant. I, I, personally had lost interest um and other than just wanting to see alabama and ohio state lose <laughs> so yeah it is good to see new teams in there you know we saw a, a, a seemingly slightly above average braves team win the world series um so yeah i i do like uh all this you know middle of the pack loaded uh situation and uh you know you, you see in hockey a lot when you see teams you know in the seven eights six, seven, eight seed, six, six through 10, we'll call it fighting tooth and nail in, uh, in the last couple weeks of the season, the last month of the season, just to try and get into the playoffs. And then, you know, you see a lot of eights over ones when come playoff time, because those teams, while the one seeds been sitting pretty, uh, the eight seeds have been fighting for their lives. And when the playoffs start, they're hungrier and they're more battle tested. And, uh, you know, in terms of football, I think the 2011 Giants pretty much broke the mold on uh or reset the bar i should say in terms of uh you know you have to have a phenomenal regular season and be one of the top favorites to to win the super bowl the giants were six and six and then seven and seven and won a terrible new <laughs> nfc east at nine and seven fighting tooth and nail to get there and then all of a sudden they were unbeatable went on to win the super bowl so sorry for uh you know you know, gratuitous New York Giants Homer reference there, but uh, I, think, yeah, I think it's kind of relevant here in uh, in, in terms of you know a seven and seven 
team went on to win the next uh, two, two, six games uh, and, and beat a very upset and uh, revenge hungry Patriots team in the Super Bowl and, you know, l- lesson learned. And I think you have a new NFL that, that pretty much changed the NFL since then. And, you know, you got these teams that are in that same position, seven and six, six and seven, uh, fighting for their lives. And whoever eventually survives uh, this battle royale to get in absolutely cannot be counted out, especially since you don't have like we said, you don't have a top heavy favorite. So yeah, this is uh, one of the more exciting, uh, you know, down to the finishes I've seen in the NFL in quite some time. Absolutely. So oh, I'm sorry, I have to make a correction here. So the Los Angeles Chargers are eight and five. Uh, the Bengals are seven and six. And the, what was the other one that I missed? The... Oh, the uh, Denver Broncos are also seven and six, so it's it, it's even a little more crazier than uh, what I initially reported. But yes, <laughs> uh, it is it, it it's you know it's it's really really interesting. the 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 NFC is not as interesting. I think it, well, I mean they have the the tightness in the wild card with a bunch of six and seven teams, but you know the division winners are the division winners in three out of the four. Um, division is the only one that's not shored up uh thanks to the los angeles rams on monday night beating the arizona cardinals uh now the rams are a game out with a game and you know basically a game in hand because they ended up uh beating the uh arizona cardinals so um everybody else is um you know dallas is nine and four there's no team remotely close to them uh the uh Green Bay Packers are ten and three, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are ten and three, and all the place teams in that division are six and seven or worse. So uh, they they those three pretty much have their tickets punched uh, to the playoffs already. While the NFC West is the only one that has an actual division race, um, and then everything else is just who's gonna suck the least to get into the wild card positions in the uh, NFC. Scott? <laughs> is he gone? Uh, I'm, I'm back. back. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, did, did you catch that last one or no? Uh, nope, sorry. Uh, more technical difficulties. Okay. Um, I heard uh, NFC West actual division race, and uh, that's all I got. Yeah, that's pretty much all it was. Yeah, so uh, the NFC East, the <laughs> NFC North, and the NFC South, um, all the second place teams are six and seven or worse. So it's it's just going to come down to who's going to suck the least in order to get into the, <laughs> the wild card playoffs. I, I'd say it's tight because you have, you know, you have uh, the Washington football team, the Philadelphia Eagles, Minnesota Vikings, the Atlanta Falcons, New Orleans Saints, all at se- at six and seven, and the San Francisco uh, 49ers who are seven and six. So. Yeah, it's it's yeah, I think it, it's it's just as close, kind of just not with the same kind of great feeling that the AFC is giving you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh what's up? Oh no, I was just gonna, you know, second that. Uh, no disagreement of course there. Um yeah, a little more little more pulling away in most of those divisions, but uh yeah, you got the same uh you know, seemingly mediocrity uh, in 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 wild card races, but again, uh, it's once uh, once the seventeen games are complete, everybody's uh, everybody's record zero and zero, and uh, it's it's this year among others. I I, I firmly believe it is literally anyone who gets in uh, Super Bowl to win. Yeah, yeah, that, that's going to be the exciting part. So, um, how about Urban Meyer, the uh, the coach of well, the former coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars ended up getting uh, unceremoniously fired from the team. That is two and eleven, but it was the, the first season of a five-year, ten million dollar a year contract. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, historically speaking, college coaches, no matter how good they were in college, have not succeeded. In the NFL, I think that's a ridiculous contract to give a. Uh, we, you know, it's like it's like they didn't know their history when they did that. I mean, you can count on literally one hand all the uh, the college coaches that are successful college coaches that have been successful in the NFL. You got uh, Jimmy Johnson, you got Don Shula, 
and um, yeah, arguably Barry Switzer, but um, I think there's one more big one I'm missing. But, you know, so there's three, maybe four. You know, look at some of the legends that have tried. Uh, uh, Nick Saban, even Nick Saban was awful. I believe he was on the Dolphins, was, yeah. was awful for a year or two. Uh, Greg Schiano gave it a shot. Uh, you know, nothing going on there with Tampa. Uh, now, granted, a lot of these guys come in to, if you're going to roll the dice on a college coach, a lot of these guys come into, you know, it's, it's like the number one overall pick going to the worst team in the league. So, you know, a lot of these college coaches are going to go to a terrible team and are given a very short leash, you know, two, three years. But, um, you know, which is unfortunate that a coach doesn't really get a fair shake. But, you know, historically speaking, college coaches have never, uh, very, very few have, have excelled in, in the NFL level. So it's not really a shock. The only shock to me was the money they gave them. <laughs> yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a messy divorce, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, you have Urban Meyer who's, who had three national championships. So it's not like he was just – any old college football coach that just walked into, you know, or actually interviewed and got an NFL uh, gig. So as, as, as much truth as you're saying with the, you know, the translation of college football coaches not being able to excel at the NFL coaching level, if there was somebody to take a chance on, it would be somebody who has three national championships because, you know, it's just, it's, you know, the, the college football pool is so deep with the teams. Like, you know, even though, you have like the rankings and there's some, you know, obviously there's some bigger schools that have advantages over some smaller schools and things like that. But I mean, the pool is pretty big to get into these uh, national championships and, you know, try to win them and such like that. Um, so I would say it was out of the realm of possibility, but you know, a, a five year deal with, with that amount of money just for uh, a head coach is definitely, uh, it was risky business and the Jaguars just lost that one. And unfortunately they're, They've been in a franchise. They've, they've been a franchise, uh, much like you know, in the, in the mold of the New York Jets and the the uh, Detroit Lions, where they just you know they just any move they make just seemingly they can't just get it right, and it's just it's unfortunate for uh, for their fan bases to have to go through this, and um, you know it's just it's not going to get any better right now because you know you know you, you can't really you can't really hire a replacement right now. I mean it's, they're already two and eleven. You know basically they just trying to box out um you know right now they have the they have you know it's it's a battle of the 2 and 11 teams uh with the Tex the Houston Texans and the the Jacksonville Jaguars uh facing off against each other this week so depending on what happens there and then Jacksonville they end up playing the New York Jets um uh, in uh, New Jersey for uh I think that's uh, two weeks from now so oh the day after Christmas so you know it's it's going to be a, a situation where who wants to lose the most just to get the higher draft pick. So, you know, there's no, that's no welcoming committee for an NFL coach to come in and try to make a difference. It has to be an off season move. And, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. You know, you have to pretty much, you have to pay urban Meyer for doing nothing right now. Absolutely. Like, you know, <laughs> in the negative, you know, yeah, the, there was, there was a, a report that came out that he actually like kicked the kicker and like was, you know, demeaning and, you know, saying names and stuff like that. I mean, that, that's, I mean, imagine like, Imagine is this the way he was successful in on the college level by like kicking kids and stuff like that? Like, what is it? <laughs> it's just uh, it's, it's really crazy <laughs> that you know that's probably why it didn't work out. But you know, it's just what were his methods that ended up um, you know having him be a a a, uh, a successful college coach? You'd have to think that you know this is not the first time he's ever you know physically harmed a, a player. Very very messy situation. Yep, indeed. There were two names that, that uh, I was doing a little research here, two names that I left off, one on each side of the uh, of the ball there. One uh, college legend that also failed in the NFL, which is Steve Spurrier. Of course, he had just, you know, Florida team after Florida team that was just, you know, top of the country. And one more uh, successful uh, that, you know, it makes the uh, very small fraternity of successful college coaches that was successful in the NFL, which is Pete Carroll, um, who, of course, has uh, had Seattle uh, Seahawks, uh, you know, top of the top of the league uh, for the last decade or so. Um, yep. So just those two names. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if Pete Carroll qualifies only because he was a coach at the NFL level and then dipped down to college and then came back up as a, uh, as a, as a head coach. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what 
the uh, the 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 career of Nick Saban and Urban Meyer was, but I'm pretty sure they they just stayed in you know the college levels, and then when they got that big jump promotion to head coach, I, I think maybe Pete Carroll knew a little more of where he was of what he was dealing with before he actually took that on, and that's why he was more successful than those other coaches that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, uh, well, we got a couple minutes left in the show. We're gonna talk. Uh, we're gonna talk some hockey now. So, the New York Rangers, in local news, is are tied for the league lead still. Uh, uh, they are uh, uh, forty one points. They're tied with the Washington Capitals on top of the division, uh, the Metropolitan Division. Uh, what do we see this week? Well, um, I think. <laughs> You know, like we said when Igor went out, we were just hoping that they would play at minimum 500 hockey, and that's pretty much what they've been doing. Uh, Got to give a good shout out to uh, to Keith Kincaid uh, last night for getting the win for the Rangers. Now, granted, it was Arizona, and a lot of Ranger fans are up in arms about that. But you know, when, when you've got one of the best goalies in the league, and you clearly have backup issues. Um, you know, you just want to keep your head above water, and that's what they've been doing. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, they yeah, they were five minutes away from losing to the, to the absolute worst team in the league, and they salvaged the win in regulation. So, I mean, that's a little – that's, you know, anybody – you know, that's even the best teams in the league are going to have losses that are terrible in the year. Nobody's going undefeated. Everybody's going to have at least, you know, double digit losses, uh, probably 20, at least 20 losses. Um, you know, even the Stanley cup winner is going to have at least 20 losses. So there's going to be losses. Um, you know, that being said, you know, again, like we talked about last week, I think this is, you, you know, when the Rangers were seven, three and three, everybody was laughing that they were, you know, the, the worst seven and three team we'd ever seen. But since then it, it, it's a different feel. Uh, they're playing more complete games. They're they're confident out there. They're hitting people. The passing is just a thing of beauty to watch. And they definitely. Um, I don't think this is a fluke. Uh, yeah, that we could. We, you know, we we could be doing this show uh, six weeks from now on the heels of an eight game losing streak. It's very possible, of course. But I think that the Rangers have taken that next step, and we, we knew this. This is what they've been building to, towards for for four years. They're, they're not done. They're going to get better. Um, but I, I think they, you know, knock on wood, and I don't want to jinx anything or get ahead of ourselves, but I think they absolutely deserve to be where they are in the standings right now. And uh, hopefully uh, they still haven't given a, a return date for Igor, but hopefully he, uh, you know, is a couple days, if not a week, uh, away from, from coming back. But uh, I love what I'm seeing uh, out of this team. They're so exciting to watch. They they look like they're having fun out there, and that's that's the, that's the key: confidence and enjoying yourselves in hockey amongst any other sport. I think it, it is the key, and they look like they look like a team, and they look like they're having fun and they're enjoying themselves, and that's why they're winning some of these games. They're they're, they're finding ways to win these games no matter who they're playing. Yeah, I'd like the record against uh, playoff teams to be a little better, but you know, again, it is early. Like, like Islander fans love to tell us when we keep pointing out the standings, it is still early. <laughs> um, and I would like another crack at some of these teams like, uh, like, like Calgary and whatnot and Colorado. I would certainly like another crack out if we get Igor back, but they're finding ways to win games. They're exciting to watch. Um, and I think they absolutely deserve to be where they are in the standings right now. Again, I, I know I've quoted them before, but I'm going to quote them again. Like the great Bill Parcells once said, you are what your record says you are. Yeah, so, uh, well, I wouldn't disagree with you on that point. But, you know, as far as this week goes, they ended up, well, since our last show, they ended up uh, beating the Sabres, the Buffalo Sabres and the Coyotes, which both of them don't have uh, more than 20 points on the season. And they lost to the Nashville Predators and the Colorado Avalanche, which is very understandable. Unfortunately, uh, they won't get any more cracks, well, uh, either fortunately un- or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it. But they won't get any more cracks <laughs> at the uh, at Calgary or uh, Colorado since they already played them twice this year. If they have, if they end up seeing them again this season, it would be in the Stanley Cup final, which would be pretty awesome. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're, we're looking ahead here. Uh, th- their schedule gets pretty. You know, it's you know they face the Golden Knights on on Friday, but then after that they have the Montreal Canadiens, who have a whole host of issues. Uh, and then the Detroit Red Wings, which are not the rollover team that they have been the past couple of years, but you know, it still could be 
a, a fairly um, win. It's a winnable game. And then you get to where you, where you're facing the Florida Panthers and the the Tampa Bay Lightning at, on the road. That's where you hope that uh, Igor Shosturkin is back and Artemi Panarin, who ended up uh, leaving the game last night. Uh, hopefully he's okay. So, you know, th- definitely a lot of uh, bumps in the road over there. Uh, and then other local news, uh, the New Jersey Devils have had a rough week. They ended up their second to last in the division with 25 points, and then New York Islanders have 19 points. They are the la- uh, the last team in the Metropolitan, area, uh, Metropolitan Division. Yeah, well, seeing the Islanders down there is always hilarious. Um, that being said, nobody expected this. Yeah, they've had injuries, and, and their season definitely should have been shut down before it was for all the COVID cases they had. Uh, trying to be objective for a second, take my hate and shoes off. Uh, I would not be, uh, as, as, a, as an objective, knowledgeable hockey fan, they, the NFL, uh, the, the, the NHL dropped the ball there. They should have shut them down a little bit earlier. So, the Islanders will be back. Uh, you know, this is a team that made the conference finals the last two years. I think they had a very good off season. Um, I like, like I said, love that they are where they are in the standings, but that's not going to last. They will get it together. They're going to start winning games. They're going to become dangerous again. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm looking at the Rangers schedule, you know, anytime, yeah, they've gone, you know, before last night, they were one in three, you know, lost three out of four. You know, when you win seven in a row, uh, 11 out of 12, you're going to hit a little rough patch. You're going to come back down to a little reality. And it's actually good to to have that now. I mean, if that seven-game win streak had become like a 15-game win streak, um, you know, they would, they, 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 they need a, you need to be kept in check every now and then. So, yeah, hit a little rough patch, um, you know, so be it. And we're, and we're going to find out what this team is made of. Yes, Arizona is Arizona, of course. But they could have very easily lost that game, too, in which case we'd be sitting here on a three-game losing streak. So I think that, uh, you know, that that last – you know, it's not the first time they did that uh, this year either. They did that in Ottawa. You know, we're down 2-0 two, two late, came back, won that game. You know, that shows no matter who you're playing. I mean, these guys, they're all, these guys are all National Hockey League caliber professional athletes. They're all paid professionals. So, you know, it doesn't matter who you're playing. Um, anybody can beat anybody on any given night. Um, so even though they've done this against, uh, you know, some of the weaker teams, it shows some character that they did find a way to, you know, to put it together and, sal- you know, salvage a victory from the jaws of defeat there in the last couple minutes. So I think that uh, that that shows a lot uh, about uh, the character of this team that they were able to snag that win last night in regulation, uh, you know, uh, on top of that. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we we need our goalie back. But um, you know, hopefully, we are playing a very tough Vegas team uh, tomorrow night. And like you said, the schedule is going to get a little rougher here. Um, uh, We'll, we'll we'll see what happens. I think uh, you know. I'm just last night was a good thing. Uh, Arizona or not, I think it's it's a good thing that they were able to find that victory and you know get the confidence back because before that, again, three losses and four nights or four games uh, that could have uh, spiraled out of control and gotten in their heads. So it's good that they uh, salvaged that win and hopefully they can uh, get back to the winning ways. They have uh, you know a seven game win streak, two four game win streaks this year. And uh, we are, you know, not even in the new year yet, so that's pretty impressive. So I'd like to see, of course, last night being the first of another win streak. But, um, you know, they needed that, and uh, hopefully they can get, uh, you know, right to ship. And it's great that we're having this conversation that, uh, you know, a a four-game span, uh, you know, five if you want to count last night because they did not play well against an inferior team. But it's great that we're having that conversation that uh, just a five-game span here, uh, and we're all panic mode, and that's because they've given us such a – you know, great, uh, you know, optimism before that, you know, <laughs> last year, we'd, we'd just be sitting here saying, eh, whatever, eh, they lost three out of four. So be it. That's what we're, that's what they do. But you know, now this is a problem and that's great that this is a problem. This very short little streak here is a problem because, you know, we think that this team is for real. Absolutely. And, uh, just to touch on top of the objective standpoint here. So the Islanders seem to be getting into a situation where they're able to score now. So, they they seem to be, you know, rightening the ship a little bit. I don't know if they'll be able to save it, you know, for the re- uh, uh, for the remainder of the season. But it seems like they're, you know, getting closer to what they what we've known them as uh, the past two seasons where they were the, you know, the uh, 
Final Four uh, finalists, or you know, Eastern Conference Finals uh, finalists. So you know, the, the, there's there's some optimism going on there for the uh, uh, for the uh, Long Island team over there. <laughs> but uh, that actually that does it for our show this week. Thank you very much, Scott Blander, for coming in again. And thank you for having me as always. All right, we'll be back next week. My name is Alfonso Caldero, LDM Radio Sports Talk. New York City's LDM Radio.